It's funny how things work sometimes, how things present themselves in clusters and patterns. I haven't played many World War I war games in my career as a war gamer, simply because it is a topic that I'm not super interested in. It's not one of my favorite topics uh, for gaming. But recently I played two after, maybe it was, that has been like years that I didn't play any. And one was uh, The Lamps Are Going Out, which I recently reviewed. And the second World War One game that I played lately is Fields of Despair, France, 1914-18, published by GMT. A uh, very interesting design, very thick box because it comes with a mounted board. We really are in an age of return of the mounted boards, so they're more and more common. And well, here we have a two-player uh, war game. Uh, also very uh, friendly to the solitaire player, not so much in the sense of multiplayer solo that you play both sides at the best of your possibilities, because if you're playing with two players actually there is a lot of hidden information here, but the game does come with a solo variant, so there is an AI, the game is fairly different, but it can be played by a single player against the AI. The game depicts uh, the Western Front, the World War One, but also taking into account the Eastern Front. It is that you see the Western Front on the map, and this is where uh, things are depicted in a more accurate fa fashion, with the pieces moving around, attacking, forming fronts, and so on and so forth. And the Eastern Front and naval warfare and other factors of that kind are abstracted in a series of tracks. Uh, it's more numerical, but still. Uh, it brings flavor and theme to the game. In any case, let me show you how Fields of Despair plays. This is the board for the game and looks super nice. I really like it. It's such a simple design, but it gets the job done. It still feels atmospheric. It still feels thematic. Uh, very simple, but then you look at the details, illustrations are detailed. I would say there is a nice balance between abstraction, which makes it functional, and detail, which makes it thematic. As you can see, the axes are larger than those that you find on most working maps, because in this game, um, both players may have of pieces of their side in the same X, which is uh, what happens when you fight. The map, again, actually, it's not just a map, but it's a board, it's an mounted board, which makes it really nice, but there's a little, at least a little bit of irony here, because at least my copy of the board does not lay flat on the table. So I may have to put under a piece of plexiglass, which is something that usually you do with paper maps. You know, with mounted boards, you love mounted boards because you don't have to use the plexiglass. But in truth, I don't know, it's not that big of a deal. I can just pretend that this is like a three-dimensional model of the Alps and I will be fine. Now, uh, as for the game, the game has a lot of secret information and each player has a player aid that is used to keep track of values, uh, of bidding in certain categories, etc, etc. Looking a little up close, you see you have a section where you'll place counters for artillery, the available or used. You will have air units, and when you spend them, they may come back damaged or simply used. Logistic points that are used to purchase several advantages. Artillery maintenance track and air maintenance track. Yes, you will have artillery and, um, and air pieces, but you can only have up to a certain number, up to a certain quantity. So, for example, if my air maintenance is 8, so well, then I can only have up to eight uh, uh, air points out there divided uh, among the counters, so the air counters that they have. And the same for um, for the artillery supply. That's how much I can actually uh, supply. Speaking of supply, supply capacity, yes, supply lines are important in this game, but it's not just like, well, I trace a supply line from my unit to a um, supply source and I'm going to be fine. You need to do that as necessary but not sufficient because the supply capacity track tells you how many axes you can actually supply. It's not automatic that all axes will be supplied. Then you have a 4x four, four <laughs> element here, um, which is the technology tracks. You will have counters placed on these tracks and they will tell you the level of quality that your technologies have in, the term, in, in certain categories. For example, aircraft improvement tells you the quality of the aircraft that you can use. Suppose that my level is a 3 
as you can see here, that means that they can have air counters with a value of one or two, such as such as such as this guy. For example, I can have this guy, I can have a two, but I cannot have, well, I guess you guessed it, a three or a four. So this is the quality of the counters they can have. And again, remember, there's the other limit that I have to take into account, which is the actual, the total number they can have. So this is an individual quality and total number. Really nice the fact that you may have you may have capacity to supply a lot of aircraft, but your aircraft are kind of like lame anyways, or you have very good ones, but maybe not many of them. Poison gas is used uh, to improve your chances of hitting the opponent. The gas mask has a protective function and tanks, so well that's good for fighting also, as you can imagine. Uh, as I said, uh, the game has a lot of secret information, so each player will have this player aid, and then there will also be a screen for each player that you will use to hide information, again, quantity of resources that you may have. Uh, the screen looks really nice on, on the side that faces the opponent, it's the same art that you find on the on the cover of the game, on the, on the box, and then also the inside has a player aid, which is all printed in small fonts. Uh, um, take out your eyeglasses, see if you grew white and old in the push of your word gaming hobby, but otherwise it's very well done, it's very, uh, the information is well laid out and it's very convenient to have it in one place. So, let's have a closer look at the map and talk about, about gameplay more in detail. This is a block game. Um, units uh, are fairly generic. There are pretty much only two types of units, so which are cavalry and infantry, with infantry being by far the most common. Well, in truth, uh, I guess that aircraft counts as units, but there are only two types of units that go on the board, move around, the functions of the other um, elements of the armies are fairly abstracted. So uh, you have blocks representing units, the blocks usually will stand on the board, the number that is on top when the block is standing is the actual present number of strength points, uh, when the unit receives reinforcements uh, the number goes up, when the unit takes hits the number goes uh, goes down. Also, uh, the blocks have, several blocks have really high numbers and you can pretty much give change freely among them. So if I have four here and that block receives two points of reinforcements, then I replace that block with a block that, uh, that now says six on top. And I add more, I go to 10, I get to 14, etc, etc. As you can see, as you probably know, in block games, at least in block most block games, the blocks stand up on the board um, facing the owning player. Now with blocks that can go all the way between 1 in value and say 20, well it's really important that you do your recon well and you figure out what your opponent has in each area before you commit to a major attack because you may be wasting tons of artillery on a weak point that doesn't require so much strength you may send a fairly strong attack against an absolutely unbreakable section of the line of the opponent. Either of those scenarios are pretty bad. So, well, here there is 9, but here there is 14. And again, somewhere else there may be 20 or more when you have several blocks. Um, like here. How much do I have there? I may have 3, I may have the sum of 19, 18, and 14, which is, I don't know, I'm not a great mathematician, you figure that out. So, very interesting idea here, very interesting idea. As for uh, gameplay, uh, when uh, the turn starts, you have a couple of things that you need to do uh, to take care of the economic, political elements of the game. First, economic maintenance, people will simply lose uh, part of their resources every turn, and attrition is a very big element in this game. Next, you have manpower deployment, and you're like, all right, I'm getting reinforcements. Yes, and that is immediately followed by attrition. You run on a table, and boom, you lose part of your resources. Then you collect economic points, which are represented by wooden cubes. Yay, so cute, I'm getting my economic points. 
sorta, because first, uh, before you can actually use them, they must survive naval warfare. Everything that you get, gets a tent in it before you can actually use it, which feels very thematic, feels definitely right. Naval warfare. Naval warfare is uh, represented, uh, resolved in an abstract way using a bag. Bags and cubes, it makes it a little Euro gamey, but trust me, this is Euro gamey looking, but trust me, this is a war game, all right. Uh, you place cubes in this bag, the players will place their cubes. I'm not showing them to you because the robot makes a big deal that you never, not ever look into the into the bag. So I don't know, maybe there is like a spelling that if I look into the bag, I'll turn into stone. So I don't want to chance that. But you dump a block, you dump cubes into the bag. The players do that and then they draw them and that will allow them to resolve actions against the opponent. If we're, when you um, resolve your own cubes, so you reduce the economic points of the opponent and of course so the more you draw the better it is. Also the um, the um, central power player, the central powers player has the chance of declaring one or two postures when it comes to naval warfare. It can be the player can chillax or the player can declare unrestricted submarine warfare. The, the, the former is sort of like a standard thing, the latter is a high risk strategy because it inflicts more damage on the opponent but also annoys the heck out of the Americans and, in, and increases the chances that the American will join the fight sooner rather than later. So after you resolve naval warfare, the economic points that survive naval warfare uh, can finally be assigned. And you spend economic points to increase your stats in the supply capacity, air maintenance, artillery maintenance, you buy technology. You also bid for initiative. After players are done spending economic points, uh, they reveal their bid for initiative. And if the non-initiative player has a higher bid than the non-initiative player, becomes an initiative player and will go first. Very important because that means that if you're an initiative player and then you gain initiative, you'll get to go twice in a row, back to back. So that can be very important if you if you want to exploit a breakthrough. So you spend your economic supplies to buy various stuff. But actually, oh, I realize now that I did neglect an important element, which is the Eastern Front. That happens, my apologies, before you look into economic maintenance, uh, the main power deployment, economic points, etc. The Eastern Front is here, in case you're wondering. No, not here, like way there, way over there. Uh, it's abstracted, but it's, it works well. And again, it is resolved in a Euro game looking look fashion. We the baggy, this time the bag uh, will receive black cubes representing the forces that the central powers are committing to the Eastern Front and red cubes uh, which represents the Russians and they're sort of like uh, abstract and abstract forces and so no, the, the Russians are non-playing card or non-playing party. Again, ha, we looked into it. Okay, we survived. Um, we you draw cubes and again, um, if it's slightly different here. Um, if there are three red cubes, so you draw three cubes, and if they are all red, this is pretty bad because this is a major major victory for the uh, Russians. If the Russians score three major victories during the game, the Central Powers lose the game entirely, which may feel anticlimactic, but it also feels right because really the central powers should, should not <laughs> neglect the Eastern Front. So there are ways of of blocking that or at least really reducing the chances of that happening, but that is a constant drain on the resources of the central power player that needs to put blocks in here. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, uh, the general supplies, the general resources uh, I'm assigned to the Eastern Front are going to be reduced uh, when red cubes are drawn. Even uh, well, again, the bad, the worst thing is if three of them are drawn, if just one of them is drawn, there's going to be still a loss for the Central Powers. Back to us, back to uh, to the main front. Well, to the Western Front, which is the one that is actually represented on the board, which is the one where we have our our cubes that are moving, fighting, etc, etc. So, uh, as I said, you, you resolve the Eastern Front in a fairly abstract fashion. You resolve 
economic elements in the game but then it is time to well to do stuff to do the military stuff and it may feel a little procedural at the beginning because there's several steps uh, the game pretty much uh, forces the players or encourages the, the players to follow a sequence of, of actions a sequence uh, of, of ways of attacking that is or should I say of organizing structuring your actions Pretty much when you go through the combat phase after players have moved, the combat phase um, in the, means that the player that is attacking first will perform air recon by spending um, aircraft, then will use artillery pieces to shell the trenches of the opponent, and then will attack with the infantry. I said will, but I should say might, and, on, and then back again to say really will. Meaning, you could just shell without doing recon, you can just perform a charge over the top out of the trenches without uh, without artillery, but it's really suicidal. The, the, the game is punishing as is, even if you follow the optimal procedure, which is again, recon, artillery, air recon, artillery, and infantry attacks. So, uh, just do it, just follow that, that procedure. So first, when you are structuring, when you're organizing your attack, you will want to do air recon first. Then you can assign, suppose I'm trying to scout these, I am the, the allies and I'm trying to scout those central to, to have a look at those pieces, then I can commit, I can commit um, aircraft markers face down. And the opponent also gets a chance of responding by placing their own phase down aircraft markers. In and then once we're done assigning these markers, we reveal all the markers and in all areas where both players have aircrafts, there's gonna be dock fighting. For each point of aircraft strength that you send there, uh, you get to roll a die, the only player rolls dice. 1 to 4, each number between 1 and 4 that you roll is a miss, a 5 is an abort, abort result, and aborts cancel each other, and 6s are hits. What the uh, defender is trying to do is to shoot down as many enemy points as possible. Each uncancelled abort and each hit reduces the recon, the recon power of the opponent. That means that if after applying those hits and those abort results, the number of recon points uh, generated by the aircraft is still a positive number, then that number is the number of blocks that the active player can look at. If the hits of the defender have brought the number down to zero or below zero, then no recon takes place. But suppose that actually I was scouting those pieces, this, uh, the defender only missed, so I have one point here of recon that has remained, that hasn't been shut down, then I can look at one of the blocks. So now I'm getting a sense, oh, look at that, uh, maybe the, there are like 10 blocks there, but they're all worth nothing. Or there's one block, but it's bigger than half of my army combined. So, um, after that recon, you can perform artillery attacks, uh, which again, you commit to by placing face down artillery pieces then you will roll dice to inflict damage on the opponent, trying to thin out uh, the opponent as much as possible. And finally, it gets to, finally we get to infantry, when all pieces are revealed. And uh, if this, uh, the, the procedure to resolve infantry combat is bucket of dice, but this has to be the biggest bucket that I've ever seen. Because you roll a six-sided die when attacking with infantry for each strength points that you have. So here I would roll 36 combat dice. I would roll 36 six-sided dice. 
which is a little silly. But luckily enough, when it gets to those numbers, you do have uh, combat tables that you use to replace uh, that. So basically, you will roll 3d6 and you will cross-reference that with the column that, uh, that represents the number of dice that you are replacing. So instead of rolling 36 dice, I roll on this column, roll 3d6, and that tells me the number of hits that I inflict on the opponent. If you are rolling, so for lower numbers, it's just fun, just roll your small bucket of dice as usual. When you're rolling dice, um, usually a 6 is always a hit, a 5 can be a hit, but not against fortresses. A 4 is usually a miss, but becomes a hit if you have uh, gas, chlorine, technology, master gas, and so you have that sort of like extra nasty weapons. Apply hit on the opponent, and that's and that resolves combat. Unless you manage with your attack to completely clear out the X of the of the defender. Incidentally, uh, artillery attacks can never clear out the X of the opponent. It takes a charge. An interesting thing is that when you're attacking with large numbers, that's good for you. Hooray! But actually, during trench warfare, that also gives advantages, give extra dice to the defender. Uh, that balances things, and simply because if you're sending a large, compact wave of people, that makes a better target for the defenders. In any case, after the results uh, are determined, if you cleared out the X of the defender, then you can perform breakout movement, and that may also lead to uh, breakout combat. And these are the main concepts of the of combat and the main concepts of the game. This is a really good game. It's very solid production. I like the components, the presentation of the game. The map looks nice. The blocks are of good quality. They're like some broken blocks like you have sometimes in block games. Like all components are great. The rulebook does a very good job of explaining how the game works. Even though uh, it may give you the impression that the game is much more procedural than it actually is. But it's not because the rule book, the rule book is poorly done. It's just the nature of the game when, when it is verbalized. It just sounds like, a, oh my gosh, how many steps do I have to go through before I get to the real deal? But once you figure out how the game works, those procedural steps at the beginning of the turn such as developing technologies, resolving the Eastern Front, naval warfare, those are real, that is the real deal. Uh, it doesn't, well, it feels very different from when you're moving blocks and attacking, but it's so well integrated and affects what you can do on the board so much that really I didn't have the sense of a fracture between those phases. They, they, they flow one into the other very well. But as you're reading the rule book for the first time, it may feel a little confusing and and, and you feel a little uh, dispersive and fragmented. So fear not, just read the rule book once, don't worry about learning everything, just breeze through the rules, then set up the game and play a couple of turns. So going through the procedures, by turn three, you will barely need to, to double check the procedures uh, and, and everything works very well. And then once you have that element of the game down, then you have an experience that really feels right, feels intense, feels uh, rich, full of history, and full of interesting decisions. It is a game that does feel historical, but also remains a game and much more than a simulation. Uh, so the abstractions that have been made around the design to me are very solid. They have been done very well because, again, they result in a series of interesting challenges. Uh, that again, they feel um, they feel historically based. They feel really um, appropriate for the theme. Attrition, attrition is king. Everything you do is gonna uh, is gonna be reduced before you really get to enjoy it, and after you get to enjoy it, to use it, just for sitting there. Then, of course, when you are sending waves of people <laughs> against enemy trenches, then it's gonna be even more murders. But I really like uh, the challenges that come from the fact that your resources are limited, they're going down, and you have so many things that you want to do with them. And it's interesting because there are certain elements of the game that really almost look like, feel like a 4X game. You don't have the exploration element, uh, but you have definitely the, the technology element with those technology tracks. But in 4X games, you do very often have a sense of increasing resources, like conquering 
having new planets and have new populations, new technology. This is sort of momentum that goes up and allows you to do more stuff. Here you're trying to have that improvement as your empire is falling apart, as your resources are disintegrating before your very eyes. So there is a very interesting element there because it feels like you have that developing of resources in forex games but in a situation of scarcity and constant reduction of resources um, as for gameplay when we're talking about the gameplay in the main section of the game moving blocks etc etc again everything feels right everything goes together well if you watch some of my videos in the past you know that i really like block games it is one of my favorite um, mechanics or family of war games because of the information that that you can keep track of in such a simple elegant way because of the hidden information, because of the look of the board, it just looks good. It, when you see the front, the heck, you just have a very strong visual feel from 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 uh, playing on a board where there are uh, wooden blocks standing up. And I think here the blocks are implemented very well. Uh, there are the games where um, the strength of a unit exceeds <laughs> for possible steps, so you replace a block with another. But here's done well. Um, again, it does it does mean that you need to keep your blocks organized because you don't want to slow down gameplay by oh no my gosh where is the thirteen block? Uh, is the, oh no this only goes to twelve. Uh, you want to keep them organized. But if you do so, then it's really fun to have this fluid uh, shifting of blocks, and making change, um, ag aggregating uh, some blocks, splitting them into uh, into smaller units. I must say there is one thing that I, that I like in terms of gameplay about World War One games, uh, and I like it as much as it sends me historically, which is the units are faceless, the units uh, pretty much are they are worth the same. This is why you do not have special values. You don't have movement value, armor, attack, etc., etc. It's waves of poor people, not poor in the sense of economically, but in the sense of the destiny that they had to face, taken from their homes, taken from their towns, sent to die in, into the trenches, uh, in situations where training was really secondary, where the number of them, the mass, again, the faceless mass of these people was all that mattered and you need a huge mass to be able to break through and at the same time of course the large mass of people was also what would cause more death and destruction because it would offer such a nice target to the machine guns and artillery pieces of the opponent so it's very tragic historically but it works very well in terms of game options because it does give you this opportunity of breaking down units uh, putting them together etc etc which also works particularly well in a situation of limited intelligence like you have here because really there is that block there sitting in an x and in other games i get a sense uh, it must be strength between one and four or six and eight here it can be anything from zero, it may be a deception block, to 20. And that matters a lot. So all those other elements, uh, going with the recon, uh, use some artillery, etc., etc. All those elements are really important. They open up the opportunity for bluffing, which is really fun. All my, my opponent now is spending a lot of of aircraft and or, or air units just to protect that block which maybe is a complete deception block so but because i completely fell for that trap now i, I just completely expended an ungodly and obscene um, amount of artillery resources to shell a completely empty uh, sector of a trench and if you know about world war one then you know that that kind of stuff happened all the time huge shellings it was completely for no reason uh artillery that, uh, that 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 turned out to be friendly fire all the sort of messes uh, you get the feel that that the game portrays them well and this complete lack of knowledge and the fact that yes you can acquire knowledge it's not impossible but it's costly so you have to find this balance between well i guess i can be daring and spend some resources in an attack which may or may not work or i can spend resources to get a perfect understanding of the situation to get to prepare the ground for my main 
end. And if I do that very well, maybe don't have enough resources to actually mount the attack. So that balance there that you have to deal with it's really fun. It's fun to study the front. It's, trying to, it's fun to try to figure out uh, the weak points while you're trying to bluff and you're trying to uh, hide your weak points because it's impossible to be very strong everywhere. You can be average strong everywhere, but again, if the opponent figures that out, then also uh, that is a disadvantage. You have to choose strong points and weak points and figure out ways of forcing the opponent to hit you your, to hit your strong points while you're trying not to hit that of the opponent and trying to cause a breakthrough. Uh, very fun. The static nature of trench warfare, which is one of the reasons why I'm usually not that interested in World War One, actually here turns out to not to hinder uh, gameplay, but actually to be uh, one of the reasons of interest, precisely because you have this like lazy, static, heavy snake on the front and pushing it by a couple of axes one way or another is a huge success or a huge tragedy. In any case, it's momentous, it, it matters. Um, so it's hard to push the front of the opponent, uh, but it's possible, and when it happens, well, there's great satisfaction. So really high praise from me for Fields of Despair. I like the components, I like the rulebook, but most importantly, I like gameplay. Uh, it it's it really uh, blends together a couple of familiar elements from very different sources. War game with blocks, forex uh, games, etc., etc., etc. But the result is something that feels more than the sum of the parts. The result is very playable. This is definitely a war game that I think a beginner war gamer could could approach. Very playable, very fun. It feels thematically right. So it really hits a soft spot for me because it's a game that has a lot of history, a lot of a lot of interesting uh, decisions in it, and it's playable. It's not like a monster that will take weeks to play, or you know, you have like dozens of pages to learn the rules. Fields of Despair by EGMT, definitely highly recommended.